David Wilcock is, is a really stellar individual, as ed, everyone here knows. And we, we thank him very much for being who he is and for putting himself in such a dedicated place to serve humanity with his life. And, and we honor him for that, and we, we um, stand right at his side, okay? Um, so that doesn't mean we agree on everything or how it will roll out or this or that. But in, in the main, we agree, all right? And, and, uh, and we're very happy to, to present him here today. David Wilcock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. All right. Uh, we do have a lot of material to cover. We don't have a lot of time. Um, how many people here need a bathroom break, or are you ready to just keep going? Just go? All right. <coughs> okay, now we've gotten the business taken care of. Let's get down to the real work, which is this subject of 2012. What I will be proposing tonight is definitely not your typical approach to 2012. It is very important to understand on an intrinsic level that what we are dealing with is not channeling, it is not Mayan prophecy, it is not ancient religious teaching, it is not speculation, it is not psychic, it does not require anything except the exacting measurement of the scientific process and the insight to be able to take information that has already been put out there by NASA, by mainstream scientists studying the mysteries of what it means to be a biological life form, the mysteries of the solar system, the mysteries of energy and matter, and how does matter and energy truly function. When you start looking at the hidden mysteries of science, which are already out there now, you find out that the human species is undergoing a massive evolutionary process right now. And I'm going to prove that to you. I'm going to prove to you that the nature of this evolutionary process fundamentally rewrites DNA and biological life to such an extreme that within one generation, I will show you the proof in this presentation that a creature can give birth to something that becomes an entirely different species than the creature that it came out of the womb from. And that there is nothing more that needs to be done to create that energetic change, but to simply zap the embryo with a light wave that comes from another embryo that has the genetic pattern that you wish to transfer. The only way that this makes any sense is to begin seeing DNA as susceptible to quantum wave effects. You may have seen, most of you have probably seen 2012 Enigma, which is a video of mine I'm proud to say was number one most viewed on Google December 1st of last year. And the reason why it got that way is because the information has rocked the internet. It has led to my getting the starring position on a sci-fi documentary coming out in November on Sci-Fi Network. It's led to Penguin contacting me to write a book based on the video, one of the biggest publishing companies out there. It's led to my working with, I'm going to say this now publicly, Jim Hart, who wrote the movie Contact with Judy, Jodie Foster. That's our screenwriter. Thank you. <laughs> I'm working on Wander Awakening, which is the album cover you see here in the slide, with a nine-time Grammy-winning musician, Larry Sire. The reason why all this big talent and why all this attention is being focused here is not because I may have been somebody else in another lifetime.
time. It's not because I have done psychic readings. It's not because I put prophecies on the internet that later were shown to come true. The biggest thing that I bring to the planet right now is to simply look at ancient prophecies that we know to exist, that we can document in great detail, and to then give a scientific framework for these prophecies on such an advanced level that we're looking at things in an entirely different way. So let's get back to 2012 Enigma for a minute. You've, most of you have seen that video. You may remember that I discuss an experiment that was conducted in which a tiny, what's called buckyball, was shot through a grating. And the grating is 100 nanometers wide. The buckyball itself is only about one or two nanometers wide. It goes through the grating and it turns into a wave. The buckyball itself, which is supposed to be a macroscopic object, goes through this little slit and for whatever reason it turns into a non-local wave. <coughs> now what does quantum non-locality really mean? It means that you don't know where the wave is in space. And you also don't know where the wave is in time. Quantum non-locality shows that the more you try to find out where it is in time, the less you can find it in space. The more you try to find out where it is in space, the less you can find it in time. And if you look at the quantum physics equations, it's well known in quantum mechanics, the time has to be both backwards, forwards, it has to be completely nonlinear in the traditional sense. Albert Einstein has given us the theory of relativity. The theory of relativity is going to tell you that when you travel through space, it's not empty space. What did Einstein call space? He didn't call it space, he called it space-time. The reason why he called it space-time is that he said you're moving through something that makes time start running faster as you go through space. So that you could literally be inside a spaceship, leave the Earth for two weeks, flying at the speed of light, come back, and it's 500 years later. We know that this has been proven. It actually was done on jumbo jets flying in the highest altitude they could, where they had little uh, watches on them, or little uh, radioactive timekeeping devices, and they found very subtle but definite changes in the speed of time just based on the velocity of a jet going around Earth orbit. So imagine what happens when you go up towards light speed. Now this is a proven principle in physics. As you move through space, you're also moving through the so-called time fabric. The space-time fabric, as Einstein called it. There was a mistake that Einstein made in his scientific understanding of space-time. And it may be a mistake or it may be that he figured it out and he didn't want to talk about what he discovered. In the Einstein relativity theory, it is assumed that the only direction you can move is into the future. That space-time, the time dimension is only one-dimensional. But we actually now know from the physics of Dewey Larson, which you'll also see on my 2012 Enigma video, that the whole way that the quantum world is being built is that there is a domain in which time, as we think of it, is three-dimensional, and space, as we think of it, is one-dimensional. And that world is constantly interchanging energy back and forth with space-time. We call it time-space over there. It's space-time over here. So this time-space realm over there is sending energy into space-time and is pinging back and forth, and that's what creates matter. The reason why this is important is that if you can get over into time-space, then you can actually travel a physical distance and return to space-time, and you have now time-traveled. And it's not just the future. You can actually travel into the past. If you're traveling in the direction that the Earth is rotating, and you travel ahead of where the Earth was rotating when you left, you're going to end up in the future because you now re-emerge in space-time ahead of where the Earth was on its timeline when you left. If you travel west, that's into the past. East is the future, west is the past. 